Welcome back to Austin Tech Talk. This is David Hazen from Live Music Stage, and I'm here with Steve Nill, Executive Vice President of GMR Marketing, the largest entertainment marketing agency in the world. Hey, Steve. Hey, how you doing? How's David? it going? Good, good, Having good. Having a good thanks. day? Yeah, so far. I mean, this is a great event as usual, and uh, great to see you guys are here. We're getting there. So I have been in awe of GMR Marketing since the very early days of music sponsorship before it was fashionable when clients had to be told music is a great way to reach your target demographic and they said, oh I don't know we better not go near that music stuff well thanks to things like the Miller Rock Network and other early uh, successful efforts by these guys Steve you just say how big you guys are because I can't even retain the numbers there are too many zeros I work in the digital space and when numbers have that many zeros, you're talking about bits, you're not talking about dollars. Well, GM, GMR's grown, of course, since the very beginning when we started with the Rock Network. And uh, we have about 800 people in 22 offices in 12 countries and, you know, doing a lot of music, but also sports and, you know, st straight digital stuff. And again, we work for brands. So that's what are some clients. of your biggest brand clients for the purposes of music? Well, Miller Brewing Company, Hershey's, uh, Visa, we do, well, with mobile, we do Pepsi. So a lot of brands like that. And there's you know, a number of other ones that might be a, a little smaller, but, but also maybe a little more adventurous at times, too. So people like Supercuts, who you would never think would, would be a big music um, user, actually their entire campaign in North America is tied to music. Tell me about that one. It's well, it, uh, eluded my radar. Well, it's interesting. We worked uh, closely with a, a sister agency, DDB, big, yes. big, big ad agency, um, and created this uh, program called Rock the Cut, where we went and signed four developing artists to do TV spots, to do point of sale, to do in-store uh, music, uh, stuff like that. And then we went out and signed another thousand artists to do a social media campaign for Supercuts. A thousand artists to do a campaign for Supercuts. Right. Which is, for those of you that don't know, a haircut place that's a chain. How many outlets? I think a couple thousand. A couple thousand, very big. But they're very, very inexpensive haircuts, right? Like right. It, 10 bucks, 20 bucks, something yeah, like that? It, it's, it's a category where there's not a lot of differentiation. And the whole reason that we came up with this idea collectively with DDB was to help create some, you know, association for supercuts with something specific. That market tends to be who's got the cheaper price this week. Right. And even when they run advertising campaigns, a lot of time those ads get attributed to their competitors. So what we tried to do is create something that they could really own. And Rock the Cut really became that. So we did that last year, very successful. Um, consumers liked it, uh, the franchisees liked it. So we're back again this year uh, with, with that. What did the artists do besides recording presumably original songs for the radio spots? Was that basically it? Well, they, they did that. There's also television. So there are a couple different artists that were actually in television. There's one, a band called Vintage Trouble. It's an amazing, amazing band uh, managed by Doc McGee, of course, um, who actually were out, oddly enough, out of sort of a, a throwback retro soul band. We're actually out playing opening for The Who this year during Quadrophenia, which is kind of interesting going back to, to their origins. But they, they've gotten so much coverage from this TV spot and being you know, on these wall posters and then, and then people pay, learning about their music, picking it up on the site. And a lot of the other bands get sort of the same thing with, you know, again, a way to expose this music on a very, very grassroots level. We were talking in the green room about how artists don't just expect a check anymore from the brand sponsors and there are brands that can bring incredibly valuable marketing resources to the table that can really be more valuable. And I think this is a great example of that. Let's talk now about another recent case study of yours where it was a big brand or a big band. Uh, there's a lot of great stuff going on in the developing artist space, but let's, uh, for contrast sake, talk about something huge that might have you know, been seen on people's uh, Super Bowl TV commercial viewing or something mainstream. Well, I think I think maybe one of the most interesting ones that we worked on for a number of years was uh, Kid Rock and Jim Beam, a very interesting uh, interesting program because Kid Rock was a big Jim Beam fan long before he did anything with the brand. I mean, this is a guy who would 
go out and buy cases of Jim Beam and send it to other artists. It's a guy who literally lived the brand. And so when, when, when he got involved with the brand, we worked on, on the program with, with, with Jim Beam. He was probably the best Im brand ambassador you could ever see from an artist. I mean, the guy would literally go to the package store near his house and he would check the shelves and if they didn't have one, you know, one skew, he would call up the brand manager and say, get your distributor down here, my store doesn't have the 750 milliliter bottle of Red Stag. I mean, craziness, you know, really wild. We did a great campaign where he actually launched new music over a holiday period where... His music? His music, brand new music of his that you could only get by being a, buying a special Jim Beam package, holiday package. For a, for a finite period of time. And it was a it download was card with a unique yeah, was, code yeah, on it? Yeah, absolutely. But but before it went out on his regular regular records. So it was really, really an amazing campaign. Wow. So that so as we were talking earlier, there are new types of deals out there that can be done if you see the if the especially the, the artist or the label sees the benefit of these kind of associations. And that type of promotional value is more valuable to Kid Rock probably than any cash that might have been part of that deal. Well, certainly, certainly with an artist of Kid Rock stature, there's going to be some financial considerations sure. and also some, you know, payment for the use, the use of, the, of the music from a licensing standpoint. But in this case, the just the scale of the campaign was very, very valuable for when he's coming out with new music or at that point, I think he was also launching some other artists that he was associated with, so we were able to help with that as well. What are you doing with Pepsi on the mobile front? Because you had told me you had acquired a company that grew to 70 people just at this mobile company alone. Well, we, as I said, we, we acquired a company about six years ago and, 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 and grown that into about a 70-person digital mobile social group. And our mobile guys do a lot of the mobile promotions for Pepsi. So the, the text messaging, the QR codes, all that kind of stuff, just across the, uh, the brands in general. And it's been very, very good and interesting. And now they're kind of looking at, well, what's, you know, now that they have this big deal with Beyonce, what's going to happen with that in the mobile space going forward? So a lot of different pieces. Cool. Do you think that there is going to be more innovative big artist campaigns or do you think the big artist campaigns with the occasional exception like Kid Rock that you said will tend to be more about the money and a lot of the innovation will be coming from the more developing artists where it's not about the money but about the mutually exchangeable promotional and marketing benefits. That's a lot of words. <laughs> no, I, no, I think it's going to come from all sides. I mean, you know, you have uh, Jay Z, who's a brand manager for Budweiser right now. Right, you right. have, you know, artists who are starting to take, you know, stock or ownership in companies that are especially developing companies. You have art artists that want to do new and different things. The Beyonce deal with Pepsi uh, puts a pool of money together for sort of shared ideas that they haven't defined yet as to what they're going to be, where they're working together to create new things. So I think you're going to see... New models, new technologies. New I think it's still up in, up in the air exactly what it's going to be. It could be new products, could be new promotions, could be all kinds of different things. So I think you're going to see it across the board. You know, I think artists are starting to like having partners with deep pockets, and very possibly, you know, after the you know the last few years with the music labels, just because of the nature of how the, how that's changed, their labels haven't had the deep pockets that they've come to expect maybe in the previous decade, and having a partner with deep pockets to where they can be creative in another environment. Is, is really exciting to a lot of them. You know, they want to be, you know, Justin Timberlake, the, the, the Beyonce's, the Jay-Z's, and many other artists that are looking for other outlets to sort of expose their creativity. That, you know, still may be rooted in music, but may have other elements at the same time. And artists want to be perceived as business people now. I think the hip hop era ushered in uh, a lot of that, and this idea of it being, you know, uh, we're just about the music man seems kind of passe uh, for a lot of artists, you know, and it's not just hip hop, the Stones, of course, are really savvy business people, and given that there's not quite as much money flying around as there used to be, I think there's a general sense of uh, getting their business chops up. Well, I think you're absolutely right, I mean, because, because there's so many more things that artists have to be involved in to 
obviously be, be as successful as they had in the past with maybe less. They have to become a little smarter and, uh, and a little more engaged and involved in their actual career, that part of their career. Now, there are people that don't really necessarily like that, though, who think that, you know, they should be purely worrying about their, you know, their creative craft, but I think it gets to the point where they really need to be a little more involved just to know what's going on and, and know what their opportunities are. I wanted to ask you about Banshee Music because I read a lot about it when it was launched as kind of a, a, a different approach to a traditional music house. And I know you were doing a lot of really cool things, commissioning original music for sports teams. And um, just personally, I'd love to hear an update on that. Well, we, it was really interesting, you know, because our, our business added a lot of sports work in the early 90s, we started working with a lot of the teams and leagues, etc., and we really realized that, you know, there's so much u music used in sport competitions. In fact, I think one, one of the uh, music supervisors at one of the NFL teams told us that he uses over 150 pieces of music in every game just in the stadium alone. And then, of course, obviously, when you talk about broadcast, there's music in the intros and the outros with ESPN or whatever. We realized that there was an opportunity for teams and leagues to actually become partners with artists in, in this music, to own some of it, to have something that becomes more about, about them and not so much just the, with the colleges too, not just about the old fight song they've had 50 years, but something newer and more contemporary. So we created this company called Banshee Music, which essentially is a publishing company that helped go out and put together, oh, maybe 350, 400 songs, sometimes with more major artists, sometimes with developing artists, artists and, and, and have used this throughout throughout that marketplace. We, we, we had a program with the NFL called NFL Game Day Music where we brought in uh, Sammy Hager and, and Jordan Sparks and uh, Sam, uh, uh, Darius Rucker and they actually recorded some of these songs for use, uh, use in, uh, in game, in broadcast, etc. So, so we've done a lot of that. Right now we've kind of... Sorry, just as the publisher, so you would own that song. If there was not a label involved, would you be the people at Banshee, you know, placing that track in iTunes, for example? Well, we, we have, sure. We, we, iTunes and TuneCore and all, all the different, uh, Amazon, et cetera, those tracks definitely go out there into the market for consumers to buy. And especially when you have, you know, teams have such a fan base. So you do a song for the Green Bay Packers, and those people are rabid. They buy everything, and the right. Dallas Cowboys. So, so it was certainly finding the passion point the consumer in doing this. Now Banshee today you know, still has all the sports music but we're doing a lot more stuff with um, with, with getting this out in a broader plane with with, with, with uh, music libraries so it's getting out and getting used in a lot of different places. Cool, cool. What's coming up that is not confidential information that you can tell us about right now? What's the deal that you're really excited about? Well, I mean, I think, you know, overall, because of what we did with Banshee, we're actually a lot more involved in the content side, where before we were much more involved in the promotions and doing licensing of other people's material, et cetera. We're also um, uh, doing a lot more helping our brands where they have music created for them, helping them uh, build their own publishing companies. Um, to where they can actually collect on some of this usage. Wow. So, you know, if, if a brand has a piece of music created as a work for hire, they use it in broadcast, uh, the networks pay the, the performing rights organizations, well, you know, the record business knows and music business knows how to, co how to collect that. A lot of times brands don't. Some of, some of our clients are very, very savvy at it, but there are others that aren't and we're helping them figure that piece of it out because, frankly, if they use it, they should monetize it too. So that's, that's a, a bigger piece fair. of what we're doing, yeah. And um, is there anything that you're doing that is digital first? I know there are digital components to all of your big campaigns, which is the case with just about all big campaigns in this day and Absolutely. age. Absolutely. But is there anything that you've done recently or are about to do that really is rooted in digital? What? There's um, there's actually one, but unfortunately I can't tell you about it because it hasn't, hasn't launched yet. One coming up that's actually almost very much 100% digital, but it's not announced. You can't yet, talk so about it even if you don't name the client. No, I can't talk okay. about it. <laughs> Sorry. Right, so you know that's going to be a good one. Yeah, yeah, definitely a good one. It's a it's a brand that really hasn't done this before, so we're really excited about it, and we have a, right. a fairly major artist involved with some um, some 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 songs that people know, but not necessarily from them. 
So we Covers. Yep. All right, time to activate the ad agency, uh, the ad age subscriptions. There you go. So we'll be reading about it. Um, what do you think is the most important single issue in digital music today? And what role do you see GMR playing in that? Well, I still, I think the, the, the biggest issue, of course, is, and we talked about this before, is the fact that consumption of music, or for the format of consumption, is changing at, at, a, at a dizzying pace. And the challenge is that the, you know, the established consumption of music, the newer, the newer, the newer version is not growing fast enough to replace the loss of the of the the last one. We talked about this from, you know, when when CDs came out, they immediately covered off on the the, the, the delta with with cassettes. When digital downloads came out, it didn't. And now when streaming, you know, streaming is sort of becoming the, the the format of choice. It's definitely not covering out covering it. And of course, you know, the labels are pushing very very high hard to get very high licensing fees from the Pandoras of the world, and basically to the point where they're probably not going to be able to exist much longer. So unless that adoption grows pretty quickly, you're going to see a lot of people dropping out of it. Um, from our perspective, um, that's I think it's great because it gives consumers a lot more access to music a lot quicker, mm -hmm. uh, a lot broader. So, you know, your Spotify account, you can listen to anything you want, whatever you want. And I think eventually the adoption, the paid adoption is going to happen. And it actually will probably make more money than the download market eventually for because more people will be in it. I think you kind of look at it, if you look at it the same way you looked at the changeover from free broadcast TV to cable and, and, and you know, satellite, it's exactly what's going to happen. It's just not happening fast enough for the rights holders. Right. For the consumer it is, but not for the rights holders. Unlike with pay TV and cable, do you see a potential role for brands to play in the acceleration of this new reality arriving faster that everyone knows is on the way but never quite gets here? Well, I think they already are. You see Look a lot of Coke's brands already. Doing with, with downloads in Europe and everything like that. You know, our neighbors and friends, Seven Digital, do private label right. uh, download stores. So you can have your own iTunes type of store. Mm -hmm only for your customers on your site. I mean, there, there's a lot that can be done there for streaming. I think on the streaming side, though, I think you're seeing a lot of brands starting to do uh, promotions with Pandora and Spotify. And when it's a big brand, they're, they're actually introducing things like Spotify to their constituency. Right. And we've done a number, a number of programs with Spotify, with big clients already. Um, Were in they North Spotify advertisers as Spot part well, of that? The, but part of it is advertising, part of it is, you know, uh, custom, custom uh, playlists, et cetera, to where now you're driving their consumers to a Spotify playlist who may not know Spotify. Right. So ultimately that's the case. And then obviously with what Beats is doing, uh, you know, next, we'll have to see where that goes. And obviously, as Jimmy Iovine has conversations with Tim Cook, we'll see if uh, if Daisy becomes the streaming source for, for, you know, for Apple. Who knows? But if that happens, then obviously there'll be a lot more awareness and hopefully a faster level of adoption. Since you're the only representative here with at least half of one foot in the traditional advertising business, if only based on your ownership, do you see all of these things as further eroding the value of traditional paid network TV spots? You know, that's, that's a real hard, hard one to say because, I mean, I think they're still not, it's still the place you get the volume. It's still where you get the most amount of people paying attention to your message at one time. I mean, the Super Bowl is the Super Bowl, right? Um, I think that what you find with, with paid advertising on, on television is truly, it's, it's, it's going to be, about, the message has to be more interesting, you know? I mean, I think, you know, Better people creative. Are, it has to be more creative to get people to really pay attention. Um, but, you know, uh, you're going to see some of that dropping just as you're seeing a viewership dropping on, on traditional television as well. And, you know, next generations are watching it on Hulu, on their iPads. They're watching video versus programming. All that's going to be cyclical and change. I don't think it's any different. Stephen, great talking to you. Thanks you very too, much. You too, Thanks, Stephen. All right. <laughs>